The following will be a reading of a story entitled The Smoky God or A Voyage to the Inner World as told to Willis George Emerson. Quote, He is the God who sits in the center on the navel of the earth and he is the interpreter of the religion to all mankind. Plato. Part one, authors forward. I fear the seemingly incredible story which I am about to relate will be regarded as the result of a distorted intellect, superinduced possibly by the glamor of unveiling a marvelous mystery rather than a truthful record of the unparalleled experiences related by one Olaf Janssen, whose eloquent madness so appealed to my imagination that all thought of an analytical criticism has been effectually dispelled. Marco Polo will doubtless shift uneasily in his grave at the strange story I am called upon to chronicle, a story as strange as a Munchausen tale. It is also as incongruous that I, a disbeliever, should be the one to edit the story of Olaf Janssen, whose name is now, for the first time, given to the world, yet who must hereafter rank as one of the notables of the earth. I freely confess his statements admit of no rational analysis, but have to do with the profound mystery concerning the frozen north that for centuries has claimed the attention of scientists and laymen alike. However much they are at variance with the cosmographical manuscripts of the past, these plain statements may be relied upon as a record of things Olaf Janssen claims to have seen with his own eyes. A hundred times I've asked myself whether it is possible that the world's geography is incomplete and that the startling narrative of Olaf Janssen is predicated upon demonstrable facts. The reader may be able to answer these queries to his own satisfaction. However far the chronicler of this narrative may be from having reached a conviction. Yet, sometimes, even I am at a loss to know whether I've been led away from an abstract truth by the ignes fatui of a clever superstition, or whether heretofore accepted facts are, after all, founded upon falsity. It may be true that the home of Apollo was not at Delphi, but in that older earth center of which Plato speaks, where he says, quote, Apollo's real home is among the Hyperboreans, in a land of perpetual life, where mythology tells us two doves flying from two opposite ends of the world met in this far region, the home of Apollo. Indeed, according to Hecatatius, Leto, the mother of Apollo, was born on an island in the Arctic Ocean, far beyond the north wind. It is not my intention to attempt a discussion of Apollo, It is not my intention to attempt a discussion of the theogony of the deities, nor of the cosmogony of the world. My simple duty is to enlighten the world concerning a heretofore unknown portion of the universe, as it was seen and described by the old Norseman, Olaf Janssen. Interest in northern research is international. Eleven nations are engaged in, or have contributed to, the perilous work of trying to solve Earth's one remaining cosmological mystery. There is a saying, ancient as the hills, that truth is stranger than fiction. And in the most startling manner has this axiom been brought home to me within the last fortnight. 
was just two o'clock in the morning when I aroused from a restful sleep by the vigorous ringing of my doorbell. The untimely disturber proved to be a messenger bearing a note, scrawled almost to the point of illegibility, from an old Norseman by the name of Olaf Janssen. After much deciphering, I made out the writing, which simply said, quote, Am ill unto death. Come. The call was imperative, and I lost no time in making ready to comply. Perhaps I may as well explain here that Olaf Janssen, a man who quite recently celebrated his 95th birthday, has for the last half dozen years been living alone in an unpretentious bungalow out Greendale Way a short distance from the business district of Los Angeles, California. It was less than two years ago, while out walking one afternoon, that I was attracted by Olaf Janssen's house and its home-like surroundings toward its owner and occupant, whom I afterward came to know as a believer in the ancient worship of Odin and Thor. There was a gentleness in his face and a kindly expression, in the keenly alert gray eyes of this man who had lived more than four score years and ten, and, withal, a sense of loneliness that appealed to my sympathy. Slightly stooped, and with his hands clasped behind him, he walked back and forth with slow and measured tread that day when we first met. I can hardly say what particular motive impelled me to pause in my walk, and engage him in conversation. He seemed pleased when I complimented him on the attractiveness of his bungalow and on the well-tended vines and flowers clustering in profusion over its windows, roof, and wide piazza. I soon discovered that my new acquaintance was no ordinary person, but one profound and learned to a remarkable degree, a man who, in the later years of his long life, had dug deeply into books and become strong in the power of meditative silence. I encouraged him to talk and soon gathered that he had resided only six or seven years in Southern California, but had passed the dozen years prior in one of the Middle Eastern states. Before that, he had been a fisherman off the coast of Norway in the region of the Lofoden Islands from whence he had made trips still farther north to Spitsbergen and even to Franz Josef Land. When I started to make my leave, he seemed reluctant to have me go and asked me to come again, although at the time I thought nothing of it. I remember now that he made a peculiar remark as I extended my hand in leave-taking. You will come again, he asked. Yes, You will come again some day. I am sure you will. And I shall show you my library and tell you many things of which you have never dreamed. Things so wonderful that it may be you will not believe me. I laughingly assured him that I would not only come again, but would be ready to believe whatever he might choose to tell me of his travels and adventures. In the days that followed, I became well acquainted with Olaf Janssen. And little by little, he told me his story, so marvelous that its very daring challenges reason and belief. The old Norseman always expressed himself with so much earnestness and sincerity that I became enthralled by his strange narrations. Then came the messenger's call that night, and within the hour, I was at Olaf Janssen's bungalow. He was very impatient at the long wait, although, after being summoned, I had come immediately to his bedside. I must hasten, he exclaimed, while he yet held my hand in greeting. I have much to tell you that you know not, and I will trust no one but you, I fully realize. He went on hurriedly that I shall not survive the night. 
The time has come to join my fathers in the great sleep. I adjusted the pillows to make him more comfortable, and I assured him I was glad to be able to serve him in any way possible, for I was beginning to realize the seriousness of his condition. The lateness of the hour, the stillness of the surroundings, the uncanny feeling of being alone with the dying man, together with his weird story, all combined to make my heart beat fast and loud with a feeling for which I have no name. Indeed, there were many times that night by the old Norseman's couch, and there have been many times since when a sensation, rather than a conviction, took possession of my very soul. And I seemed to not only believe in but actually see the strange lands, the strange people, and the strange world of which he told. And to hear the mighty orchestral chorus of a thousand lusty voices. For over two hours, he seemed endowed with almost superhuman strength, talking rapidly, and, to all appearances, rationally. Finally, he gave me into my hands certain data, drawings, and crude maps. These, he said in conclusion, I leave in your hands. If I can have your promise to give them to the world, I shall die happy. Because I desire that people may know the truth. For then, all mystery concerning the frozen Northland will be explained. There is no chance of your suffering the fate I suffered. They will not put you in irons, nor confine you to a madhouse, because you are not telling your own story, but mine. And I, thanks to the gods, Odin and Thor, will be in my grave. And so beyond the reach of disbelievers who would persecute. Without a thought of the far-reaching results the promise entailed, or foreseeing the many sleepless nights which the obligation has since brought me, I gave my hand, and with it a pledge to discharge faithfully his dying wish. As the sun rose over the peaks of San Jacinto, far to the eastward, the spirit of Olaf Janssen, the navigator, the explorer and worshipper of Odin and Thor, the man whose experiences and travels, as related, are without a parallel in the world's history, passed away, and I was left alone with the dead. And now, after having paid the last rites to this strange man from the Lofoden Islands and the still farther north, northward Ho, the courageous explorer of frozen regions, who in his declining years, after he had passed the four-score mark, had sought an asylum of restful peace in sun-favored California. I will undertake to make public his story. But first, of all, let me introduce one or two reflections. Generation follows generation, and their traditions from this misty past are handed down from sire to son. But for some strange reason, interest in the ice-locked unknown does not abate with the receding years either in the minds of the ignorant or the tutored. With each new generation, a restless impulse stirs the hearts of men to capture the veiled citadel of the Arctic, the circle of silence, the land of glaciers, cold wastes of waters, 
winds that are strangely warm. Increasing interest is manifested in mountainous icebergs, and marvelous speculations are indulged in concerning the Earth's center of gravity. The cradle of the tides, where the whales have their nurseries, where the magnetic needle goes mad, where the aurora borealis illumines the night, and where brave and courageous spirits of every generation dare to venture and explore, defying the dangers of the farthest north. One of the ablest works of recent years is Paradise Found, or The Cradle of the Human Race at the North Pole, by William F. Warren. In his carefully prepared volume, Mr. Warren almost stubbed his toe against the real truth, but missed it, seemingly by only a hair's breadth, if the old Norseman's revelation be true. Dr. Oroville Livingston Leach, a scientist, in a recent article says, quote, The possibilities of land inside the earth were first brought to my attention when I picked up a geode on the shores of the Great Lakes. The geode is a spherical and apparently solid stone, but when broken, is found to be hollow and coated with crystals. The earth is only a large form of geode, and the law that created the geode and its hollow form undoubtedly fashioned the earth in the same way. In presenting the theme of this almost incredible story, as told by Olaf Janssen, and supplemented by manuscript, maps, and crude drawings entrusted to me. A fitting introduction is found in the following quotation. Quote, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And also, quote, God created man in his own image. Therefore, even in things material, Man must be godlike, because he is in the likeness of the Father. A man builds a house for himself and family. The porches or verandas are all without and are secondary. The building is really constructed for the conveniences within. Olaf Janssen makes the startling announcement through me, a humble instrument, that in like manner, God created the earth for the within. That is to say, for its lands, seas, rivers, mountains, forests, and valleys, and for its other internal conveniences, while the outside surface of the earth is merely the veranda, the porch, where things grow by comparison, but sparsely like the lichen on the mountainside, clinging determinedly for bare existence. Take an eggshell, and from each end, break out a piece as large as the end of this pencil. Extract its contents, you'll have a perfect representation of Olaf Janssen's earth. The distance from the inside surface to the outside surface according to him, is about 300 miles. The center of gravity is not in the center of representation of Olaf Janssen's Earth. The center of gravity is not in the center of the Earth, but in the center of the shell or crust. Therefore, if the thickness of the Earth's crust or shell is 300 miles. The center of gravity is 150 miles below the surface. In their logbooks, Arctic explorers tell us of the dipping of the needle as the vessel sails in regions of the farthest known north. In reality, they are at the curve, on the edge of the shell, where gravity is geometrically increased. 
while the electric current seemingly dashes off into space before toward the phantom idea of the North Pole. Yet this same electric current drops again and continues its course southward along the inside surface of the Earth's crust. In the appendix to his work, Captain Sabine gives an account of experiments to determine the acceleration of the pendulum in different latitudes. This appears to have resulted from the joint labor of Peary and Sabine. He says, quote, The accidental discovery that a pendulum, on being removed from Paris to the neighborhood of the equator, increased its time of vibration, gave the first step to our present knowledge that the polar axis of the globe is less than equatorial, that the force of gravity at the surface of the Earth increases progressively from the equator toward the poles. According to Olaf Janssen, in the beginning, this world of ours was created solely for the within world, where are located the four great rivers, the Euphrates, the Pison, the Gihon, and the Hidekel. These same names of rivers, when applied to streams on the outside surface of the earth, are purely traditional from an antiquity beyond the memory of man. On the top of a high mountain, near the fountainhead of this four rivers, Olaf Janssen, the Norseman, claims to have discovered the long-lost Garden of Eden, the veritable navel of the earth, and to have spent over two years studying and reconnoitering this marvelous within land, exuberant with stupendous plant life, and abounding in giant animals. A land where people lived to be centuries old, after the order of Methuselah and other biblical characters. A region where one quarter of the inner surface is water and three quarters land. Where there are large oceans and many rivers and lakes. Where modes of transportation are as far in advance of ours as we, with our boasted achievements, are in advance of the inhabitants of darkest Africa. The distance directly across the space from the inner surface to inner surface is about 600 miles less than the recognized diameter of the Earth. In the identical center of this vast vacuum is the seat of electricity, a mammoth ball of dull red fire not startlingly brilliant, but surrounded by a white, mild, luminous cloud, giving out uniform warmth, and held in its place in the center of this internal space by the immutable law of gravitation. This electrical cloud is known to the people within as the abode of the smoky god. They believe it to be the throne of the Most High. Olaf Janssen reminded me of how, in the old college days, we were all familiar with the laboratory demonstrations of centrifugal motion, which clearly proved that, if the Earth was a solid, the rapidity of its revolution upon its axis would tear it into a thousand fragments. The old Norsemen also maintained that from the farthest points of land on the islands of Spitsbergen and Franz Josef Land, flocks of geese may be seen annually flying still farther northward, just as the sailors and explorers record in their logbooks. No scientist has yet been audacious enough to attempt to explain, even to his own satisfaction, toward what lands these winged fowls are guided by their subtle instinct. However, Olaf Janssen has given us a most reasonable explanation presence of the open sea in the Northland is also explained. Olaf Janssen claims that the northern aperture, intake or hole, so to speak, is about 1,400 miles across. In connection with this, let us read what explorer Nansen writes on page 288 of his book. Quote, I have never had such a splendid sail. 
on to the north, steadily north, with a good wind, as fast as steam and sail can take us, an open sea mile after mile, watch after watch, through these unknown regions, always clearer and clearer of ice, one might almost say, how long will it last? The eye always turns to the north as one paces the bridge. It is gazing into the future. But there is always that same dark sky ahead, which means open sea. Again, the Norwood Review of England, in its issue of May 10th, 1884, says, quote, We do not admit that there is ice up to the pole. Once inside the great ice barrier, a new world breaks upon the explorer. The climate is mild, like that of England. And afterward, balmy, as the Greek Isles. Some of the rivers within, Olaf Janssen claims, are larger than our Mississippi and Amazon rivers combined. In point of volume of water carried, Indeed, their greatness is occasioned by their width and depth rather than their length. And it is at the mouths of these mighty rivers, as they flow northward and southward along the inside surface of the earth, that mammoth icebergs are found, some of them 15 and 20 miles wide, and from 40 to 100 miles in length. Is it not strange that there has never been an iceberg encountered either in the Arctic or Antarctic Ocean that is not composed of fresh water? Modern scientists claim that freezing eliminates the salt, but Olaf Janssen claims differently. Ancient Hindu, Japanese, and Chinese writings, as well as hieroglyphics of the extinct races of the North American continent, all speak of the custom of sun worshiping. And it is possible, in the startling light of Olaf Janssen's revelations, that the people of the inner world, lured away by glimpses of the sun as it shone upon the inner surface of the earth, either from the northern or the southern opening, became dissatisfied with the smoky god, the great pillar or mother cloud of electricity, and weary of their continuously mild and pleasant atmosphere, followed the brighter light and were finally led beyond the ice belt and scattered over the outer surface of the earth through Asia, Europe, North America, and later Africa, Australia, and South America. The following quotation is significant. Quote, It follows that man, issuing from a mother region, still undetermined, but which a number of considerations indicate to have been in the north, has radiated several directions. That is, migrations have been constantly from north to south. Madame le Marquis G. de Saporta in Popular Science Monthly, October 1883, page 753. It is a notable fact that, as we approach the equator, the stature of the human race grows less. But the Patagonians of South America are probably the only Aborigines from the center of the Earth who came out through the aperture usually designated as the South Pole, and they are called the Giant Race. Olaf Janssen avers that, in the beginning, the world was created by the great architect of the universe, so that man might dwell upon its inside surface which has ever since been the habitation of the Chosen. They, who were driven out of the Garden of Eden, brought their traditional history with them. The history of the people living within contains a narrative suggesting the story of Noah and the ark with which we are familiar. He sailed away, as did Columbus, from a certain point to a strange land he had heard of far to the northward, carrying with him all manner of beasts of the fields and fowls of the air, but was never heard of afterward. On the northern boundaries of Alaska, 
and still more frequently on the Siberian coast are found boneyards containing tusks of ivory in quantities so great as to suggest the burying places of antiquity. From Olaf Janssen's account, they have come from the great prolific animal life that abounds in the fields and forests on the banks of the numerous rivers of the inner world. The materials were caught in the ocean currents or carried on ice flows and have accumulated like driftwood on the Siberian coast. This has been going on for ages and hence these mysterious boneyards. On this subject, William F. Warren, in his book, already cited, pages 297 and 298, says, The Arctic rocks tell of a lost Atlantis more wonderful than Plato's. The fossil ivory beds of Siberia excel everything of the kind in the world. From the days of Pliny, at least, they have constantly been undergoing exploitation, and they are still the chief headquarters of supply. The remains of mammoths are so abundant, as Grotokop says, the northern islands of Siberia seem built up of crowded bones. Another scientific writer, speaking of the islands of New Siberia, northward of the mouth of the river Lena, uses this language. Large quantities of ivory are dug out of the ground every year. Indeed, some of the islands are believed to be nothing but an accumulation of drift timber and the bodies of mammoths and other antediluvian animals frozen together. From this, we may infer that during the years that have elapsed since the Russian conquest of Siberia, useful tusks from more than 20,000 mammoths have been collected. But now for the story of Olaf Janssen. I give it in detail, as set down by himself in manuscript and woven into the tale. Just as he placed them are certain quotations from recent works on Arctic exploration, showing how carefully the old Norseman compared with his own experiences those of other voyagers to the frozen north. Thus wrote the disciple of Odin and Thor. Part 2. Olaf Janssen's Story My name is Olaf Janssen. I am a Norwegian. Although I was born in the little seafaring Russian town of Uleaborg, on the eastern coast of the Gulf of Bothnia, on the northern arm of the Baltic Sea. My parents were on a fishing cruise in the Gulf of Bothnia, and put into this Russian town of Uleaborg at the time of my birth, being the 27th day of October, 1811. My father, Jens Janssen, was born at Rodwig on the Scandinavian coast near the Lofoden Islands, but after marrying, made his home at Stockholm because my mother's people resided in that city. When seven years old, I began going with my father on his fishing trips along the Scandinavian coast. Early in life, I displayed an aptitude for books, and at the age of nine years, was placed in a private school in Stockholm, remaining there until I was 14. After this, I made regular trips with my father on all his fishing voyages. My father was a man fully six feet three in height and weighed over 15 stone a typical Norseman of the most rugged sort, and capable of more endurance than any other man I have ever known. He possessed the gentleness of a woman in tender little ways, yet his determination and willpower were beyond description. His will admitted of no defeat. I was in my 19th year when we started on what proved to be our last trip as fishermen, and which resulted in the strange story that shall be given to the world. But not until I have finished my earthly pilgrimage. I dare not allow the facts as I know them to be published while I am living. 
for fear of further humiliation, confinement, and suffering. First of all, I was put in irons by the captain of the whaling vessel that rescued me. For no other reason than I told the truth about the marvelous discoveries made by my father and myself. But this was far from being the end of my tortures. After four years and eight months' absence, I reached Stockholm, only to find my mother had died the previous year, and the property left by my parents in the possession of my mother's people. But it was at once made over to me. All might have been well had I erased from my memory the story of our adventure and of my father's terrible death. Finally, one day, I told the story in detail to my uncle, Gustav Osterlind, a man of considerable property, and urged him to fit out an expedition for me to make another voyage to the strange land. At first, I thought he favored my project. He seemed interested, and invited me to go before certain officials and explain to them, as I had to him, the story of our travels and discoveries. Imagine my disappointment and horror when upon the conclusion of my narrative, certain papers were signed by my uncle, and, without warning, I found myself arrested and hurried away to the dismal and fearful confinements of a madhouse, where I remained for 28 years. Long, tedious, frightful years of suffering. I never ceased to assert my sanity and to protest against the injustice of my confinement. Finally, on the 17th of October, 1862, I was released. My uncle was dead, and the friends of my youth were now strangers. Indeed, a man over 50 years old, whose only known record is that of a madman, has no friends. I was at a loss to know what to do for a living, but instinctively turned towards the harbor where fishing boats in great numbers were anchored. And within a week, I had shipped with a fisherman by the name of Jan Hansen, who was starting on a long fishing cruise to the frugal to the Lofoden Islands. Here, my earlier years of training proved to be of the very greatest advantage, especially in enabling me to make myself useful. This was but the beginning of other trips. And by frugal economy, I was, in a few years, able to own a fishing brig of my own. For 27 years thereafter, I followed the sea as a fisherman, five working for others, and the last 22 for myself. During all these years, I was a most diligent student of books, as well as a hard worker at my business. But I took great care not to mention to anyone the story concerning discoveries made by my father and myself. Even at this late day, I would be fearful of having anyone see or know the things I am writing and the records and maps I have in my keeping. When my days on earth are finished, I shall leave maps and records that will enlighten, and I hope, benefit mankind. The memory of my long confinement with maniacs and all the horrible anguish and sufferings are too vivid to warrant my taking further chances. In 1889, I sold out my fishing boats and found I had accumulated a fortune quite sufficient to keep me the remainder of my life. I then came to America. For a dozen years, my home was in Illinois, near Batavia, where I gathered most of the books in my present library, though I brought many choice volumes from Stockholm. Later, I came to Los Angeles, 
arriving here March 4th, 1901. The date I well remember, as it was President McKinley's second inauguration day. I bought this humble home and determined here in the privacy of my own abode, sheltered by my own vine and fig tree, and with my books about me, to make maps and drawings of the new lands we had discovered, and also to write the story in detail from the time my father and I left Stockholm until the tragic event that parted us in the Antarctic Ocean. I well remember that we left Stockholm in our fishing sloop on the third day of April 1829 and sailed to the southward, leaving Gothland Island to the left and Oland Island to the right. A few days later, we succeeded in doubling Sandemar Point and made our way through the sound which separates Denmark from Scandinavian coast. In due time, we put in at the town of Christiansand, where we rested two days, and then started around the Scandinavian coast to the westward, bound for the Lofoden Islands. My father was in high spirit because of the excellent and gratifying returns he had received from our last catch by marketing at Stockholm, instead of selling at one of the seafaring towns along the Scandinavian coast. He was especially pleased with the sale of some ivory tusks that he had found on the west coast of Franz Josef Land during one of his northern cruises the previous year, and he expressed the hope that this time we might again be fortunate enough to load our little fishing sloop with ivory instead of cod, herring, mackerel, and salmon. We put in at Hammerfest, latitude 71 degrees and 40 minutes, for a few days rest. Here we remained one week, laying in an extra supply of provisions and several casks of drinking water, and then sailed towards Spitsbergen. For the first few days, we had an open sea and favoring wind, and then we encountered much ice and many icebergs. Any vessel larger than our little fishing sloop could not possibly have threaded its way among the labyrinth of icebergs or squeezed through the barely open channels. These monster bergs pre presented an endless succession of crystal palaces, massive cathedrals and fantastic mountain ranges, grim and sentinel-like, immovable as some towering cliff of solid rock, standing silent as sphinx, resisting the restless waves of a fretful sea. After many narrow escapes, we arrived at Spitsbergen on the 23rd of June and anchored at Wijade Bay for a short time, where we were quite successful in our catches. We then lifted anchor and sailed through the Hindlopen Strait and coasted along the northeast land. It will be remembered that André started on his fatal balloon voyage from the northwest coast of Spitsbergen. A strong wind came up from the southwest and my father said that we had better take advantage of it and try to reach Franz Josef Land, where, the year before, he had, by accident, found the ivory tusks that had brought him such a good price in Stockholm. Never, before or since, have I seen so many sea fowl. They were so numerous that they hid the rocks on the coastline and darkened the sky. For several days, we sailed along the rocky coast of Franz Josef Land. Finally, a favoring wind came up that enabled us to make the west coast. And after sailing 24 hours, we came to a beautiful inlet. One could hardly believe it was the Northland. The place was green with growing vegetation. And while the area did not comprise more than one or two acres, yet the air was warm and tranquil. It seemed to be at that point where the Gulf Stream's influence is most keenly felt. On the east coast, there were numerous icebergs, yet here we were in open water. Far to the west of us, however, were ice packs. And still farther to the westward, the ice appeared like ranges of low hills. In front of us, 
and directly to the north lay an open sea. My youthful imagination was fired by the ardor, zeal, and religious fervor of my good father, and I exclaimed, Why not sail to this goodly land? The sky is fair, the wind favorable, and the sea open. Even now I can see the expression of pleasurable surprise on his countenance as he turned toward me and asked, My son, are you willing to go with me and explore? To go far beyond where man has ever ventured? I answered affirmatively. Very well, he replied. May the god Odin protect us. And quickly adjusting the sails, he glanced at our compass, turned the prow, in due northerly direction through an open channel, and our voyage had begun. The sun was low in the horizon, as it was still early in the summer. Indeed, we had almost four months of day ahead of us before the frozen night would come on again. A little fishing sloop sprang forward, as if eager as ourselves for the adventure. Within thirty-six hours, we were out of sight of the highest point of the coastline of Franz Josef Land. We seemed to be in a strong current running north by northeast. Far to the right and to the left of us were icebergs, but our little sloop bore down the narrows and passed through channels and out into open seas. Channels so narrow in places that had our craft been other than small, we never could have gotten through. On the third day we came to an island. Its shores were washed by an open sea. My father determined to land and explore for a day. This new land was destitute of timber, but we found a large accumulation of driftwood on the northern shore. Some of the trunks of the trees were 40 feet long and 2 feet in diameter. After one day's exploration on the coastline of this island, we lifted anchor and turned our prow to the north in an open sea. I remember that neither my father nor myself had tasted food for almost 30 hours. Perhaps this was because of the tension of excitement about our voyage in waters farther north, my father said, than anyone had ever before been. Active mentality had dulled the demands of the physical needs. Instead of cold being intense as we had anticipated, it was really warmer and more pleasant than it had been while in Hammerfest on the north coast of Norway some six weeks before. We both frankly admitted that we were very hungry, and forthwith I prepared a substantial meal from our well-stored larder. When we had partaken heartily of the repast, I told my father I believed I would sleep as I was beginning to feel quite drowsy. Very well, he replied. I will keep the watch. I have no way to determine how long I slept. I only know that I was rudely awakened by a terrible commotion of the sloop. To my surprise, I found my father sleeping soundly. I cried out lustily to him, and starting up, he sprang quickly to his feet. Indeed, had he not instantly clutched the rail, he would certainly have been thrown into the seething waves. A fierce snowstorm was raging. The wind was directly astern, driving our sloop at a terrific speed, and it was threatening every moment to capsize us. There was no time to lose. The sails had to be lowered immediately. Our boat was writhing in convulsions. A few icebergs, we knew, were on either side of us, but fortunately the channel was open directly to the north. But would it remain so? In front of us, girding the horizon from left to right, was a vaporish fog or mist, black as Egyptian night at the water's edge, and white like a steam cloud toward the top, which was finally lost to view as it blended with the great white flakes of falling snow. Whether it covered a treacherous iceberg or some other hidden obstacle against which our little sloop would dash and send us to a watery grave or was merely the phenomenon of an arctic fog, there was no way to determine.
By what miracle we escaped being dashed to utter destruction, I do not know. I remember our little craft creaked and groaned as if its joints were breaking. It rocked and staggered to and fro as if clutched by some fierce undertow of whirlpool or maelstrom. Fortunately, our compass had been fastened with long screws to a crossbeam. Most of our provisions, however, were tumbled out and swept away from the deck of the cuddy. And had we not taken the precaution at the very beginning to tie ourselves firmly to the masts of the sloop, we should have been swept into the lashing sea. Above the deafening tumult of the raging waves, I heard my father's voice. Be courageous, my son, he shouted. Odin is the god of the waters, the companion of the brave, and he is with us. Fear not. To me, it seemed there was no possibility of our escaping a horrible death. The little sloop was shipping water. The snow was falling so fast as to be blinding, and the waves were tumbling over our counters in reckless white sprayed fury. There was no telling what instant we should be dashed against some drifting ice pack. The tremendous swells would heave us up to the very peaks of mountainous waves then plunge us down into the depths of the sea's trough as if our fishing sloop were a fragile shell. Gigantic, white-capped waves, like veritable walls, fenced us in, fore and aft. This terrible, nerve-wracking ordeal, with its nameless horrors of suspense and agony of fear, indescribable, continued for more than three hours. And all the time, we were being driven forward at fierce speed. Then, suddenly, as if growing weary of its frantic exertions, the wind began to lessen its fury and by degrees to die down. At last, we were in perfect calm. The fog mist had also disappeared and before us lay an iceless channel, perhaps 10 or 15 miles wide with a few icebergs far away to our right and an intermittent archipelago of smaller ones to the left. I watched my father closely determined to remain silent until he spoke. Presently he untied the rope from his waist and without saying a word began working the pumps which fortunately were not damaged leaving the sloop of the water it had shipped in the madness of the storm. He put up the sloop's sails as calmly as if casting a fishing net, and then remarked that we were ready for a favoring wind when it came. His courage and persistence were truly remarkable. On investigation, we found less than one-third of our provisions remaining, while to our utter dismay, we discovered that our water casks had been swept overboard during the violent plungings of our boat. Two of our water casks were in the main hold. Both were empty. We had a fair supply of food, but no fresh water. I realized at once the awfulness of our position. Presently, I was seized with a consuming thirst. It is indeed bad, remarked my father. However, let us dry our bedraggled clothing, for we are soaked to the skin. Trust to the god Odin, my son. Do not give up hope. The sun was beating down slantingly, as if we were in a southern latitude instead of in the far northland. It was swinging around, its orbit ever visible, rising higher and higher each day, frequently mist-covered, yet always peering through the lacework of clouds like some fretful eye of fate, guarding the mysterious Northland and jealously watching the pranks of man. Far to our right, the rays decking the prisms of icebergs were gorgeous. Their reflections emitted flashes of garnet, of diamond, of sapphire. A pyrotechnic panorama of countless colors and shapes 
while below could be seen the green tinted sea and above the purple sky. You have been listening to a reading of The Smoky God, or A Voyage to the Inner World, as told to Willis George Emerson and related by one Olaf Janssen. This is a story that I was introduced to by my friend Nathan of the Tartary Nova community. Great friend who always has wonderful, interesting tidbits of lore and mythology to share during our conversations. Uh, We're going to leave Olaf Janssen and his father, Jan Janssen, where we ended today, having just survived a frightful storm and having apparently broken through the weather into new undiscovered country far to the north of anything explored up to their time. The story certainly seems to be written in a documentary fashion. I don't have much in the way of any kind of opinion on this regarding the veracity of the tale. I would say clearly as a modern reader, we might look at this as a bit of a fanciful tale of hollow earth mythology. I absolutely love the matter of fact tone and nature of this story. Much like some of my favorite fiction of my formative years, that of Jules Verne, this is a style that I've come to love. Does it freeze you as a reader for the duration of the story to simply put yourself there, suspend disbelief as we do with our movies and television shows today? And just travel with Olaf through his adventures. We'll continue this story in the next episode of the podcast. I want to thank everybody who is here listening right now and still with me in August of 2021. At the time of this recording, we're closing in on the fourth anniversary of the podcast. I've taken the last couple months almost entirely off in the midst of the continuing, ever-lengthening pandemic. Um the onslaught of fear porn news coming at us from every angle. I can't pretend other than to be suffering from, I don't know, a bit of frustration. I don't know if it's exactly burnout. I still love this podcast. I love recording and being here with you. And recently I was very heartened to receive an email from a listener who is uh, living in Mexico at this time and has been for a number of years. This person is a a Canadian individual. They've been listening for a couple of years already. They literally emailed me just to check in, to see how I'm doing, to see, you know, what's been going on. They haven't heard a new podcast in a minute. You're absolutely right. You haven't. Uh, And they offered their help in researching topics, uh, which was just the just the boost I needed. Thank you so much, Marshall, for your email, for reaching out. Tony, you continue to be an inspiration and a constant source of support. I have yet to do anything useful with the SDR radio dongle, but the Windows computer is finally plugged in as of yesterday um, down in my downstairs workshop. And uh, I think when I get done right here today, we'll walk downstairs and try to plug that dongle in and start figuring out what's happening with SDR radio. Uh, All right, we're going to wrap it right about here for you for today. 
doing this all on mobile, playing with my phone. So, yeah, I'm sure a few of you are going to have some, you know, feedback on the audio quality. Let's just get through this. All right, we'll see how it goes. Um, I will probably record the entirety of A Smoky God this way for the consistency of the sound, good, bad, or indifferent. So get ready for that. Uh, By the looks of the length of this story, we'll probably wrap it up in the next episode in just about the same amount of time. Uh, Finally, as I get ready to sign off with you here, I um, beseech you all to please subscribe to my new YouTube channel that is called Mobility and Comms with KJ7WQK. That's me, Steve, KJ7WQK, also known as Kilo Juliet 7, Whiskey Quebec Kilo. That's my amateur radio call sign, and uh, you can use that to look me up if you happen to be an amateur radio operator yourself in QRZ. Um, Very excited to hear from any of you who might be listening who are involved in amateur radio. Um, That would be really wonderful to know and understand. My new YouTube channel is centered around bikes, motorized, electric, motorcycle, etc. That's the mobility part of comms and mobility. And the comms side of the name of the YouTube channel is focused on exploring and learning all about amateur radio and the uh, capabilities of amateur radio communications equipment today in the modern world. Uh, Something I am very excited about and have been learning about for the last several months and I'm really enjoying. Um, It's amazing stuff. Check out the YouTube channel, please. It will serve as the Baked and Awake backup home on YouTube should anything ever happen to the Baked and Awake channel. Um, Comms and mobility content will be quite different than what you're used to on Baked and Awake. It will be very, excuse me, very practical, very... Um, very focused kind of content, but we all know I am who I am. You guys know me. Um, I'm interested in comms and mobility because of my other interests, emergency preparedness, um, you know, just general, uh, family emergency robustness, right? Uh, Self-sufficiency, that sort of thing. Um, That's what comms and mobility is all about. When the roads get blocked up and the cars are stuck in gridlock, I feel like we'll be able to get around both locally and in the cases where we need to travel further afield on two wheels much more easily than on four in almost all circumstances. Obviously, there's trade-offs when you go mobile on bikes, over cars. You have no shelter. You can carry much less equipment. Mm. But the level of mobility is accordingly greater. So um, that's what we're going to explore on mobility and comms with KJ7WQK. That is where you'll also see content happening in between uploads here on Baked and Awake. As always, Please reach out to me with suggestions for content, questions that you have about content that I've already created, uh, anything, just to check in and say hello, as my friend Marshall did recently. Um, It means the world. You guys know I'm not on social anymore. We're not going back on there either. So let's operate out here independently in the, you know, autonomous zone of the internet that exists outside of the Facebook sandbox and the Twitter sandbox and the Instagram sandboxes of the world. Um, I am determined to exist out here. And if it makes me more ghostly and ephemeral and I don't know, mysterious to find somehow, um, It's not really by design, but so be it, if that makes sense. Hopefully it does. It's been a weird year. Check the YouTube channel for a recent live update where I tell you all about a uh, family reunion we just had that turned into a 
god dang super spreader event for COVID. Um, good times. Everybody's fine. We all made it through. But, yeah, it's just weird times, you guys. Anyway, I'm loving a smoky god. The smoky god, excuse me. And I hope you are too. Um, leaving you on that. Uh, not exactly cliffhanger, but that nice relaxing moment in Olaf Janssen's adventure. Uh, things are about to get nutty in the next part of this story. So look for this update coming to your podcatchers real soon. Thank you guys for bearing with me over this quiet summer, you know, a couple months of quietude on the podcast front. I'm still here. I'm still keeping the lights on. I'm still paying the bills. Uh, I still love patrons. I still love the patrons that I do have and appreciate the heck out of them. Um, and absolutely would welcome new support. Four years in, still at it. This is really the only longest break I've ever taken was this summer since we started. And, uh, you know, as fall comes back around and it gets a little darker and a little cooler and my room up here becomes a little bit more hospitable again during daylight hours, the family goes back to school, you'll probably be hearing from Steve just a little bit more. So, you know, get at me. Get me those suggestions. Um, let me know what you want to hear about. Let me know what you've been up to. Let me know how all this stuff is going for you lately in the last year or so. Um, share comments with me in your emails and let me know if you want me to share them on the podcast. It would delight me to share some comments from anybody who wants to write in and say hello. The email address, as always, is talk to us at bakedinawake.com. All right, I think we got it. You guys are absolutely amazing. I love you all, and uh, I hope you're taking care of each other. Follow me over on Mobility and Comms with KJ7WQK on YouTube. I want to see those numbers on subscribers jumping up. I need that baked and awake community with me over there on comms and mobility. Come along. It'll be fun. I promise. All right. You know what to do. Smoke that indica. Do shit anyway. Until next time.